Welcome back to Decouple. Today I'm joined by returning guest, I think quadruple returning guest, Edgardo Sepulveda, um, our favorite regulatory economist, uh, specializing um, in telecommunications policy, but with a recent interest. I think it's uh, like five or six years now. I'm not sure if we yeah, how yeah, we call that <laughs> in electricity <laughs> and uh, and decarbonization. So a very warm welcome back to you, Edgardo. Uh, thank you again, Chris. Uh, very happy to be back. I feel like it's been a couple months. Um, you've self introduced yourself a number of times. I think our listenership's pretty familiar with you. But you know, just how, how have you been? How, how, what have you been up to for the last uh, few weeks or months? Uh, good. Um, I've, uh, I'm now double vaccinated, so that's, that's good. I think, uh, I had gotten the first jab, uh, a couple of months before, uh, our first interview, but sub- subsequently second and feeling pretty good about it. Awesome. Awesome. Alrighty. So today we have a very interesting show, uh, for you, my beloved listeners. Um, and you know, our listenership is very international. Um, we're about 50% North America, but, the other 50% is all over the world, Europe, Australia, and 100 countries around the world, including bizarre places like Andorra and Guam, et cetera. So we're very blessed to have this big international audience. We're going to be um, in this show focusing on the case study of Ontario, which I think to my listenership is of interest because Ontario is one of those magical um, jurisdictions where we have achieved deep decarbonization of our electricity sector, at least. Um, of you know CO2 emissions of something like 20 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. I know that's a bit of a nerdy figure, but um, that compares quite quite favorably around the world as as one of the lowest carbon grids in the world. And you know I think um, advocates of nuclear power are um, quoted often as saying you know the the only successful um, deep decarbonizations that have occurred around the world have been either as a result of you know just being blessed with ridiculous amounts of hydro. Um, Norway springs to mind, uh, the province of Quebec and Ontario, but elsewhere where hydro is not uh, as prevalent, um, nuclear and hydro have paired well um, and have delivered that deep decarbonization. So Ontario really shines as one of those jurisdictions. Um, We have some hydro, but not enough to to get us there. Nuclear provides 65% of our our electricity. And as a result, we have ultra low emissions. I often joke that Ontario is the France of North America. I mean, Quebec is where they speak French. It's the French colony. But in terms of our energy supply, we have a contribution from nuclear that's you know just behind France. So again, to sort of position this case study and make it of interest more broadly, there you go. There's some context. And you know, I've got Edgardo on today um, because this is another interesting um, case study because we're going to be discussing um, our carbon tax and some of the flaws of it, and also the shuttering of Pickering Nuclear Station, um, which is going to be replaced by uh, fossil fuels, um, which fits the, the pattern around the world of, of nuclear plant closures. Um, so we've got some interesting uh, topics uh, to discuss today, um, <clears throat> and I hope uh, our international listeners will be, will be interested in this case study. So Edgardo, again, um, welcome back, and, uh, and let's get into this. Sure. Excellent. Looking forward to it. Um, how would you like to begin? I mean, did you want to have a little bit of uh, an overview of Ontario? Um, yeah, no, that, that sure. Great. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've, I've, I've brushed over the, uh, you know, the broad strokes, but if you want yeah. to get a little more detail, yeah. let's, let's start there. Yeah, just so just so people understand, it's sort of, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's the most populous province in Canada. Uh, I think the last time I checked, we're at 15 million people. So it's a fairly large jurisdiction. Um, in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the output, uh, in terms of our grid, we've got to, I'm going to round numbers, but uh, current output is about 140 terawatt hours. Um, nuclear is about 75 of those. Uh, natural gas is about 10. Hydro is about 40. Uh, and non-hydro renewables is is that is to say both wind and solar is about twenty. So mm-hmm. that sort of breaks down the grid. Our hydro resources are mostly all tapped out. I mean, the stuff that we we've already dammed or the the run of river, um, we we don't have much more of that. So in terms of in terms of sort of clean electricity, our options basically are nuclear, wind, and solar. Uh, hydro, we've done as, f- as much as we can within our provincial borders. 
And, you know, as my listenership is very aware, um, you know, there's there's often uh, a fantasy propagated by the green movement that, um, you know, nuclear can be replaced by wind and solar. Um, but our independent electricity systems operator has shown that when Pickering shuts down, um, it's largely going to be replaced by gas. I think something like 90 percent of its output, if I'm not mistaken. That- that's right. So, so uh, in terms of uh, in terms of background, um, the there was a decision taken on together by the provincial government and uh, the state-owned enterprise that still provides for about fifty percent of our electricity, called the Ontario Power Generator uh, Generation, which is OPG, to basically decide not to refurbish one of the three. Uh, nuclear generation stations called uh, Pickering, um, and uh, and that's going to happen in 2024-25, and so that um, uh, that and and Pickering accounts for an average of about 20 terawatt hours uh, per year, and so uh, uh, already the uh, the electricity RTO here called the ISO is predicting that most of those 20 terawatt hours are going to be replaced by an increase in natural gas uh, generation. Um, And so this is going to be akin to what is happening or what happened in Indian Point in New York, what is likely to happen in, you know, in Byron and Dresden in Illinois, uh, and certainly what happened in Germany and some of these other countries and Belgium that have announced uh, closures of 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 uh, of nuclear generation stations, um, and the replacement is not coming from uh, non hydro renewables. It's not coming from hydro. It's coming from fossil fuels. Yeah, yeah, and you know, with Indian Point, um, I, this is something that really stupefied me and brought it into sharp focus for me. Is that in that morning when uh, the remaining reactor at Indian Point went offline? I believe it was May first, uh, twenty twenty one. The equivalent amount of energy of clean energy that went offline it was the same as the entire wind and solar fleet in terms of, of output. Um, and that, of course, is the same situation for Pickering. Uh, Pickering, you said 22 terawatt hours in wind and solar in Ontario, 18.3 terawatt hours. So um, we are essentially, it's, it's kind of analogous to, you know, going around and smashing every single <laughs> solar panel and felling every single wind turbine, um, you know, in that morning or that series of days when, uh, when we shut down. Um, this enormous nuclear station. And yeah, it's, it's, it's Groundhog Day, right? It's Groundhog right. Day. It's the same story everywhere. These local decisions are, um, uh, it's Groundhog Day. I mean, we will have a one-to-one replacement of, of uh, the nuclear output by gas output um, okay. in, in Ontario. And this is of uh, interest because it's occurring in the context of um, of a carbon tax, and we're not going to get uh, you know way too deep into the details. Um, I think most people are very aware of what a carbon tax is. Um, I think you know I was thinking of it more on a personal level of okay, it costs me a bit extra, you know, at the gas station. Um, that's disincentivizing me from driving a gas car. Maybe I'll move over to an electric vehicle. Um, you know, very market friendly mechanism to gradually incent behavioral changes. Um, very different than um, Ontario's remarkable decision to make the burning of coal illegal. And, you know, that's really what cleaned up our grid in the first place. But yeah, I mean, my, my conception of a, of a carbon tax was that, you know, every ton was taxed. Um, and it was very much based on that sort of individual assumption. You know, carbon is taxed and, and redistributed to the people and it uh, incentivizes good behavior um, and low carbon choices. Um, but in the case of Ontario, I understand our carbon tax for our large emitting um, generation, electricity generation, is uh, not being taxed in the same way. So can you uh, explain that to us? Sure. Yeah. And we'll, we'll, summarize, uh, we'll summarize the numbers and some of the concepts. But um, I, I guess one of the things I should say, Chris, is that I, this is, you know, for those who want to do a deep dive, uh, a little bit of a wonky deep dive dive on these issues, I would refer, and we should include it in the, in the show notes, I would refer people to uh, a, f- a 4,000-word um, uh, blog with figures and tables uh, on which you know, this analysis is made on, 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 on one of the websites that I participate in called the Progressive Economic Forum. Uh, you'll see there that it's about the eighth uh, 
blog uh, on the Ontario electricity sector that I've that I've uh, prepared and researched in the last five or six years. Um, and so for those who are interested in, in taking a deeper dive into these numbers, I would recommend that they refer to that and we'll put it into show notes. But, but in summary, what I, what I did in this, in this research, Chris, was um, given these political and policy decisions as to um, the decision to shutter and not refurbish and eventually shutter um, uh, Pickering uh, and have it replaced by, um, by uh, the ramping up of, of, of gas generation. Um, I was interested in looking at whether uh, the carbon tax and the imposition of the carbon tax in Canada and in Ontario would mitigate any of that uh, climate damage, right? So there's a, there's a political and policy decision uh, associated with uh, generation, uh, and in Ontario, um, our listeners would know it's highly politicized, uh, as it is in many other jurisdictions. And so, I was interested in knowing that could market-based uh, uh, mechanisms, such as a carbon tax, could they mitigate the climate damage that results from political and policy decisions? Like I said, including the increase of twenty uh, terawatt hours. Um, of uh, of additional gas generation, and so uh, the short answer is no. <laughs> and part of the short answer is because it's a badly designed carbon tax and is not fit for purpose for Ontario. So that's sort of the the the, the takeaway. Um, and the reasons are twofold. Um, the first part is that it is it is overly narrow. Um, and insufficiently stringent, right? And so we can we can parse those two aspects that is too narrow and not stringent enough. It's very very lax, and we can talk about that. The bottom line number is that um, when you know right now we have a carbon tax in 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 Ontario, um, we'll have uh, a new version of that carbon tax uh, next year in 2022. But whether we look at Today's version um, or next year's version, um, only about nine uh, percent of gas emissions from those that uh, gas generation will be taxed. Wow! Um, and ninety-one uh, percent, therefore, is basically exempt, and there will be no tax applied to that ninety-one percent. Um, and there's a, a, a long history as to why that is, but the bottom line is that um, it is so lax and exempts such a large portion of, of current and future uh, emissions uh, resulting from um, gas generation, which is the only emitting form of electricity generation we have right now in Ontario, that it's really not going to make a big dent. It's not going to correct for the policy and political mistakes that, that we've talked about that have led to this reversal of fortune from us becoming sort of like a, from us 20 years ago in Ontario being yeah, kind of like middling in terms of our, of our cl uh, cleanliness of the, of the grid to being a world leader. And the result of these policy and political decisions is now we're going in reverse. And okay. this is in the context of the IPCC report yes. that came out earlier this week that you know we should do more and better. And after uh, the heavy lifting that we've all gone through in, this, in Ontario, we're actually going backwards. And that is very, very disappointing. And, you know, it's interesting, this this carbon tax is obviously coming uh, too late, uh, certainly to impact OPG's decision around, um, you know, whether or not to refurbish Pickering. Um, we're estimating, again, that uh, emissions are going to rise by something like 7 to 10 million tons of CO2 a year for that gas <laughs> substituting Pickering. Um, 10 million tons taxed at uh, $50 a ton is, is a lot of money. Um, we're talking half a billion dollars a year. And I mean, the carbon tax is supposed to not just stay at 50 uh, tons per, per uh, sorry, $50 per ton. It's supposed to go up a lot. So this, this um, is going to be, you know, 
would be punishing to uh, to OPG um, and maybe a suitable punishment for having uh, made that error and not refurbishing Pickering, but it's going to be borne by ratepayers. And as we've talked about in, in previous episodes, high electricity prices are highly socially regressive. Um, they punish the poor. That's right. That's right. Um, and the other thing that it does is that it, um, it only taxes. Um, so the way in which... Uh, uh, Emission trading schemes work, uh, whether it's the, the ones in Europe or some of the ones in, in, in Quebec or BC or Alberta, is that um, there's, it's, it's kind of like a carrot and stick process, right? So you, you, you penalize um, emissions and you, you credit uh, performance that is below a benchmark. Right, and so you establish a benchmark, and if you're above the benchmark, uh, you you get dinged with a with a carbon tax, and if you're below it, you get credits. And so the idea being is that uh, it incents you to not only lower your emissions below the benchmark, but even go beyond that because you're actually receiving credits that subsequently you can trade in a secondary market, um, and and it's actually cash in hand. Um, which, which that and that cash in hand is supposed to say is supposed to encourage you to I guess make further investments, build more generation that's low carbon. That's right. And that's take right. That bright sunny future of uh, 1.5 degrees instead of three to four degrees, which is that, which is catastrophic. It really is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we haven't even discussed IPCC before because I know you've you've had uh, a recent guest on that. So the the idea being is that um, it's ineffective. Um, and a lot of this is tied with um, the federal provincial uh, politics, which we're not going to get into too much here because it's it's very Canadian specific. But but um, you know the carbon tax and the idea of a carbon tax um, is 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 politically charged here in Canada, as it is in many countries, um, and and the. Provincial government was kicked, was dragged, kicking and screaming into this. Um, they challenged the uh, what is called the federal backstop, uh, and went all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, and they determined that in fact it is constitutional, and so that it should apply. Um, and so, basically, what what the provincial government did is that they they did the minimum necessary to comply with that ruling and have instituted a, uh, a generic carbon tax for large emitters in Ontario that is really not fit for purpose for a jurisdiction like Ontario that is uh, very low emission uh, and that has basically achieved um, uh, that deep de- decarbonization by effectively having reduced its carbon footprint by 90% over the last um, 15 years. Another another part of this context, which I think will make this uh, episode interesting to our international listeners who both know the example of France pretty well and, and their famous comparison with what's gone on in Germany, where you know around 500 billion euros have been spent on building a parallel generation system, 110 gigawatts of, of wind and solar. And, and it has reduced, reduced emissions very modestly by sparing some burning of fossil fuels, but still, you know, often 10 times higher emissions than here in Ontario or, you know, seven times that of, of France. That's a kind of key argument that many pro-nuclear advocates put forward for, hey, if you're going to make a half a trillion dollar investment, um, you can do it in something that's got a historical track record of working or something that we're now seeing as an evidence base of not really working, certainly not getting us to the deep decarbonization or anywhere near the net zero, which the IPCC says that if we get to, we can at least stabilize temperatures. We get to two, three degrees, at least they will hopefully hold steady if we get to net zero. So Right. And the have not delivered that in jurisdiction after jurisdiction, even the ones where the most investment has been made. Now, the reason I was saying that that's of interest to Ontario is I was describing Ontario as the France of North America in terms of our generation mix, um, almost as uh, much nuclear as France. And in the uh, early 2000s, we embarked on something that was inspired very much by the uh, energy venda. We tried to become the Germany of North America. Um, And we have spent something um, or will spend something uh, 
I think in the last eight years, we've overpaid almost $40 billion on electricity because of very lucrative contracts that were handed out um, to wind and solar developers, contracts which lock us in for 20 years. And apparently by 2032, that'll be $133 billion um, that, that has been uh, put into um, you know, overpaying for electricity. And, and is that, again, am I, am I right on that? Is, lar- is that largely as a consequence of, of this Green Energy Act? And, and how does that re- compare to, you know, refurbishing Pickering? Yeah, well, look, I mean, the, the, um, the, one, of the, one of the advantages, one of the advantages that Ontario had, um, and this is sort of for those of us who believe in, in the maintenance um, and uh, increase in, in public provision of power. One of the advantages that Ontario had compared to other jurisdictions is that um, when uh, the reform process started in 2000, 2002, we had a, a monopoly state-owned enterprise that owned all generation and all distribution. That was Ontario Hydro. Um, and they also included, all, they also owned all coal generation stations, right? And so, the political decision to um, to wean ourselves off um, uh, off coal was literally a we. That is to say, that there was a political decision uh, at the provincial capital to instruct the state-owned enterprise to actually uh, shut down over a period um, uh, of seven years, uh, it's, it's called generation stations. And it didn't have to pay OPG anything. It didn't have to, it didn't have to go through the expensive process of negotiating with private generation stations to kind of wean themselves off as the federal government is doing right now in Nova Scotia, in Alberta, they're paying coal generation stations. And this is the case in Germany as well. They're paying coal generation stations to shut down because they're privately owned, right? So when the state, when the government says somebody to shut it down, that private enterprise can come back and say, well, look, this is going to cost me money. You just can't tell me you have to compensate me. And that effectively is what's happening in most of the world. One of the advantages of doing that in Ontario was that it was all within the, the same government. So there was none of that process of making it more expensive. So that's one context. It was relatively cheap to do that in terms of there was no further, you know, further uh, out of market compensation for that process. And, and just to interrupt um, for a second, like coal was 25% of our grid. Yeah, so 25%. We had a, we had a pretty yeah. dirty grid at that point. Yeah, and, I mean and that, that reduction or that elimination of coal was called the greatest greenhouse gas reduction measure in North America. So yeah, yeah, very significant. Yeah, very significant. Um, and and so most of that was replaced by uh, the coming back onto line of of nuclear, right? So there was a bunch of stuff that was a bunch of uh, units that were you know uh, had been mothballed or were in the process of being um, refurbished. And so about uh, my calculation depends upon which base year you use. About seventy-five percent of the 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 demand that was um, taken offline from coal was replaced by nuclear, and the rest of it was a combination of about um, of wind and to some extent uh, gas as well. So the heavy lifting in terms of um, the uh, the heavy lifting in terms of replacement of the lost generation from the coal uh, phase out was in fact nuclear uh, and then secondary uh, gas and wind. So th- the bulk of that was done um, by those nuclear stations. And then what happened was, as you say, very very much like in in Germany, there was a political decision to promote. Um, wind and solar. Um, and uh, like in Germany, uh, much of it was done through these, what are they called? Um, feeding tariffs, FITs, um, that paid um, a, a very high and attractive price um, to developers and homeowners to install um, wind farms, solar farms, and, 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 and uh, rooftop solar. 
And we're seeing the result of that now in terms of that overbuild and overpayment um, to the extent that um, electricity prices in Ontario became such a, such a political issue. Um, we saw all kinds of disconnections from uh, low-income households as it became very expensive. Uh, the word energy poverty was introduced for the first time uh, in the province. And to such an extent that um, the, uh, the government decided, and this is like a one thing that uh, first time in, in, in North America that I'm aware of, has decided to subsidize end user prices in Ontario uh, to the tune of about 25%. Uh, and that is costing uh, the provincial government uh, $6.5 billion a year. That's, uh, that's interesting because I think this is stuff that happens in the third world, right? Because when electricity prices go up, you have a revolution. And that's right. There kind of was a, I mean, an electoral revolution. Some people say that the reason that our natural governing party, the, the Liberal Party, um, was booted out of power had a lot to do with uh, the rise in these electricity prices and the promise uh, by the federal, sorry, the provincial conservative government that came in to scrap these contracts, which were, which were costing Ontarians so much. Well, that's exactly it. And so you have this, you have this overbuild uh, of, of excess capacity at, at inflated prices. Um, and, and, so, um, and so you have this political reaction. Um, and, you know, it's probably the case, Chris, that, um, you know, the sector, as it is in many other uh, jurisdictions, is so politicized that, you know, the decision not to refurbish Pickering is probably you know, has to be kind of analyzed in that context uh, of highly politicized decision-making in the context of, 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 you know, a strong political, at the time, a strong political um, championing of, 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 you know, intermittent renewables. Uh, and, you know, the political, you know, and the objective of making that transition uh, successful at whatever cost, and you know, so you know, uh, and whatever cost means is that you know the taxpayer is on the hook. Yeah, and I mean, I, I've been in conversations with OPG recently. I, I full disclosure here, um, I am uh, leading this campaign called "Tax the Gas and Save Pickering." So I've been in conversations with OPG who are you know not keen on us uh, having that messaging because it's not good for them in a couple of ways. If if the gas is taxed, then their investment of three billion dollars in gas stations. Um, becomes much less lucrative for them. Um, but in those conversations, you know, they've said there's no economic case for refurbishing Pickering. And Pickering are, they're kind of small modular reactors. Uh, they're about 500 megawatts compared to our larger stations, 800 megawatts. They're less economic um, to run and to refurbish because of that scale. It's very interesting because OPG is pinning their entire uh, future on, on building even smaller SMRs um, of, of 300 megawatts. Um, but I mean, we talk about there's no economic case. There's certainly a climate case for it. Um, but, you know, the pragmatics of running a campaign that basically are saying, hey, we've made a bunch of really big mistakes. We didn't refurbish Pickering. We spent between three and 10 times the, the amount uh, of money that it would take to refurbish Pickering on these uh, renewable resources. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's, it's difficult because you're running this campaign and you're saying, hey, we should maybe have to increase costs even more on the rate payer. Um, that's a very difficult uh, thing to swallow. But I wanted to, you know, we've had a previous episode where we talked about carbon abatement costs um, and that adding wind and solar, say, in Poland, for instance, you know, where emissions are, what, like 50 times that of Ontario, can make some yeah, they're they're running about eight hundred grams, like seven or eight hundred grams. So you, you spare them burning some coal because you're throwing some wind on the grid. But the addition of wind and solar to the Ontario grid, um, that's very different. Can you can you explain that to our listeners? Yeah, yeah. The carbon abatement basically says is that um, the 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 cost uh, this the the cost the social cost of adding subsidized wind and solar into the grid is maybe 200 to $250 uh, per avoided ton, right? And so, um, and, and so that's the way that one of the ways in which one of the metrics uh, 
that that uh, that economists use to kind of assess the cost benefit of of adding to the grid is you say okay well um, how much is a cost uh, how much how much carbon can I avoid by making a particular investment and that takes into account basically the social cost of cap uh, the social cost of carbon and the studies in Ontario have been that at least on the wind side it's probably very much the same case for uh, solar is that the addition of, of wind to already a, a low uh, carbon grid um, is probably in the order of maybe $250 per ton avoided. And that is well above our current carbon tax of $40 per ton, and certainly well above our, um, you know, what will be next year. And depending on the political decision, making in, in at the federal level here, um, even the, the 170 that may or may not apply for 2030. So it's a very expensive way to, um, to decarbonize our, our, our grid. And it I, goes I to that, the- I guess that poses the, the question of, you know, what is the carbon abatement cost of refurbishing Pickering, um, which I guess we'll have yeah. to- We'll have to sort that out and get those numbers to be well. That has to be sorted out, but you know, in in other in other instances, it's well below that, right? In other in other examples that have been made in the United States and in and in the UK, it's you know it's below a hundred uh, and certainly comparable uh, to to that other cost, especially when it's talking about refurbishing existing nuclear rather than you know new build. Right. Um, but, but you know, the, the bottom line that I want to say here is that the carbon tax will not save us. Um, <laughs> and, and whether or not you think that carbon tax is, is and what is, what is the appropriate mix of, of, of uh, you know, abatement policies and climate policy and whether or not you believe, um, you know, carbon tax uh, should or should not play a role in that policy the way in which it's been designed in Ontario uh, um, and given sort of past decisions um, that again, the takeaway from, you know, from this work that I've done, um, you know, in this analysis is that the carbon tax, unfortunately will not save us in a sense, Chris, it's, it's part of, it's, 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 it's kind of like performative, you know, people talk about the carbon tax as if they don't need to do anything else. Um, and, and I think what we have to do is see through that PR, see yeah. through that hype and understand that the way it actually gets designed. And this means having to kind of roll up your sleeves and look at what's going to happen. And, and you say, oh, that's just like a fig leaf, you know, yeah. the, this is not going to save us. And, and more importantly, it was probably not designed to save us. It was designed to basically, uh, at least in, in the case of Ontario, is to comply uh, with a federal carbon tax that the provincial government took to Supreme Court to fight against its constitutionality. But I mean, the federal government is, is equally as guilty here because they're, they're the ones who set this level of, I think it's three, 370 grams of, uh, of CO2 per kilowatt hour. And, and that is basically the emissions at the stack of many of these gas plants. And I think you were even saying that, you know, we know that closed cycle gas plants are, are more efficient, have lower emissions, that they right. may in fact be able to sell carbon credits to <laughs> our open cycle gas plants, um, which I think is, is kind of truly shocking to me. Yeah, yeah, the, the, 370, the 370 benchmark um, uh, was established uh, by the federal government and it was supposed to apply for, um, you know, it's the federal backstop, right? So the way it was designed by the federal government was that it would be, uh, you know, it would be kind of like uh, a default plan uh, that would apply to all provinces that did not have their own kind of carbon tax. Um, and it, so in that way, it, it wasn't designed specifically for Ontario. It was designed as sort of like a lowest common denominator. And so um, given um, our provinces, and uh, for those of us who are not familiar with, with Canada, we have we basically have two Canadas when it comes to uh, when it comes to the electricity grid. First of all, um, just by way of context, like in many federal countries, um, electricity and energy are provincial jurisdictions in Canada, and so they're not federal 
jurisdiction. There aren't national jurisdictions. And so, you know, in Canada, we basically have uh, two sets of provinces. We have very clean grid provinces with carbon intensities below 50 grams per kilowatt hour. And those are mostly uh, hydro and nuclear, right? So, so for example, Quebec, um, uh, BC, uh, British Columbia, uh, Newfoundland, uh, Ontario, and PEI uh, are all, um, you know, uh, at 20, 30, 40 grams per kilowatt hours. And then you have um, uh, the other provinces um, so that would be Alberta, Saskatchewan, uh, Nova Scotia, uh, and I'm forgetting one, I'm sure, um, uh, New Brunswick, uh, that, are, that, are, that have uh, relatively uh, dirty grids uh, in the range of, of 500, maybe 600 grams per kilowatt hour. And so, um, and, and, and so we average in Canada uh, around, um, you know, 150 grams per uh, kilowatt hour, but that's basically we have two extremes, right. right? And so when 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 a federal government has to try to design um, a scheme that is going to become like be able to be applied uh, across the entire country, what they usually do, and certainly what they've done in this case, is they kind of take the lowest common denominator, mm-hmm. right? And so they have to be able to have a carbon tax that is not too bad for like an Alberta, Saskatchewan. Um, uh, in terms of too stringent, even though they have very, very high uh, um, uh, emissions, but also could also be applied to a Quebec or a BC or an Ontario. And so what they come up with is sort of this no man's land of 370 um, uh, uh, benchmark that is only applied to um, uh, gas plants. And so, um, you know, it's that meaningless, it's meaningless in Ontario where gas plants are the only emitting source, but in, in other provinces, it may incentivize a transition from coal to gas. Well, that's exactly it, right? So what, you, what, you, what, what needed to, be, to happen in Ontario was um, if Ontario was, if the Ontario government was serious about uh, uh, having the carbon tax actually do its job, it would have customized uh, what was uh, established as a default by the federal government and made an, a fit for Ontario uh, process, like other provinces have done, like Quebec has done, like British Columbia or even Alberta. And they didn't do that because they were opposed in principle to the carbon tax. Um, and they just took the minimum necessary, which was um, this default plan that had been designed by the federal government to fit everyone, but nobody. Right. You know, people um, sometimes uh, maybe accuse me of being a little bit harsh on on wind and solar, and maybe that's a valid uh, criticism or an accurate um, portrayal of of my opinions. I mean, the reason that is 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 because it's personal for me, right? I'm I'm proud to to live in a a place which is a world leader in in uh, decarbonization of electricity. We're told we need to electrify everything. Um, you know, this, this is something I'm, I'm proud of. And we made a series of, of pretty terrible decisions. We decided not to refurbish Pickering. We decided to follow this um, energy venda. And, you know, the addition of, of wind to the grid in particular, especially when it got first priority on the grid, um, it actually raised costs because we had to shut down nuclear to accommodate it. Nuclear had to go offline for three days. Um, in the meantime, we actually had to burn a lot of gas to, uh, to firm up that intermittent wind. Um, so that increased, we spent, I think, an extra 200 million a year on the, the gas we had to burn and also it drove up our emissions. So the addition of wind to our grid, um, at least initially, actually increased our emissions and increased our price. And now we end up you know, curtailing it a fair amount because it's not allowed first access on the grid. And maybe it contributes a, a few grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour reduction. But and that's that's why it's personal. Um, I think uh, we're trying to kind of keep this uh, on the shorter side because it is uh, you know very focused on Canada. Um, so maybe just a final final comment, uh, Edgardo, and then uh, then we'll sign sure. up. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I mean, look. I, I think uh, takeaway for, for 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 me and for you know hopefully for the international audience is that um, like. Indian Point, like Germany, like Belgium, 
uh, the shuttering of a nuclear station in Ontario uh, will be replaced 100% or very close to 100% with fossil fuels. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's not a different story. These are not outliers. That is what's going to happen. That's what we're predicting it's going to happen. And that kind of policy and political decision, um, which is sort of the macro level, um, unfortunately, will not be severely impacted or the, the climate effects of that kind of political and policy decision are not going to be mitigated by a lax badly designed carbon tax. And so, you know, carbon taxes in this instance uh, are not going to save us. And they're not going to, they're not going to reverse uh, what is ultimately a a, a climate mistake, uh, whereby after 15 hard years of slogging and paying uh, a lot of money (laughs) to the tune of uh, that it has to be subsidized to $6 billion, uh, a very significant achievement in Ontario that came at a very high price, and to see it reversed, uh, and to go back up the the you know the emissions ladder is very disappointing. And and unfortunately, the carbon tax, as designed, um, is not going to help us for this particular policy decision. It still means that possibly in the future, a better designed carbon tax that actually has some teeth mm-hmm. uh, could in the future help the kinds of investment decisions um, um, that kind of lead us to this situation where we're going to increase our emissions uh, by two or three times uh, yeah. in a short five or six years. Yeah. So, um, you know, for the Canadian listeners, I mean, God, even for the international listeners, um, you know, CO2 emissions uh, do not respect uh, national boundaries or really any kind of boundaries. We all share the same atmosphere. Um, shameless plug here for uh, for my campaign or the campaign of uh, Canadians for nuclear energy. Um, if you go to taxthegas.org, um, you'll find a very nice website that, uh, again, explains some of these details. Um, we have a petition there. Um, please go ahead and sign it. It's basically calling for us to um, rapidly move the goalposts on our carbon tax um, so that we end up capturing all of natural gas um, and, uh, and to refurbish uh, Pickering, um, which is again, uh, just a, been referred to as uh, you know, climate cathedrals or clean energy cathedrals. Um, it's uh, it's going to be a, a tricky thing for us, but uh, we feel like it's it's the right thing to do. So um, if this was of interest to you and you want to take some kind of action, a call to action, uh, please go to uh, taxthegas.org. Um, so we're going to have show notes um, for the wonks out there to, to deep dive. Um, Edgardo, thank you so much again for, for coming on and, and telling this, uh, I think, very interesting story and case study. Great. Happy to be here. All right. Bye for now. Bye.